Yeah. God bless you this morning. Amen. God is good. Might be a unknown fact to a lot of you is whether you feel God moving or not. He's still moving. Amen. He ain't waiting for you to do something. How many understand that? God is not waiting for you to acknowledge him so that he can do something. Without you, he was moving. Amen. You know, one of the problems we have in our, you know, we're going to get right in the word. One of the problems that we have with our um, uh, serving God the way that we're supposed to in the fullness of his glory is our imagination of who God is. Imagination what God can do. What you and I need to get rid of is our performance-oriented mission. That we get rewarded from God by performance. If I do this, God does that. You cannot strong arm God. The Bible says while you were yet sinners, before you'd done anything, God saved you. While you were yet sinners, God had made a way for the cross of Calvary. You see, the imagination captures our mind and keeps us from experiencing the fullness of a God, God Almighty. This is, I, I believe, our 11th week of this series. And I believe it's an important series because it could be liberating because the pulpits across America have captured your imagination and made you think performance orientation, oriented thinking, rather than grace thinking. Yeah. Amen. I need to get this from God, so I need to fast and I need to pray. It was his grace that gave it to you. All your fasting does, all your praying does, put you in alignment with God's word. It doesn't strong arm God to make him do what he, called, what he said he would do anyway. See, when you're walking in faith, when you're walking with, and you say, we're walking, you can't walk in faith without your imagination because your imagination kickstarts your faith. You have to see it in your mind before you can, before you can, uh, uh, before you can be, make it become a reality. Your imagination, your imagination is a creative part of your faith. Amen. As I said before, somebody had to imagine what this pulpit looked like before they created it. The reason why there's so many believers that are sitting where they're sitting still, year after year after year after year. I've been saved five years. I've been saved 10 years. I've been saved 15 years. And nothing's changed except my job. Amen. I still have bad attitudes. My marriage ain't fixed, man. I'm still struggling through life. I'm, 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 I'm faking it till I make it. Amen. I'm faking the joy. I'm faking the peace. I'm faking everything until I make it. Your imagination has you bound and captivated to all the problems, to the date of all your, all, all your hurts and all your pains. You know, uh, it reminds me of an organization, a group of people that get together on a weekly, daily, and hourly basis to complain about their lifestyle. Amen. If they miss a meeting, oh my God, I'm going to fall apart. I'm nothing against those meetings. They're good. But there's, there, 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 there's more to life than those kinds of meetings. How many of you are talking about? There's more to life than coming to, to, uh, uh, to our Christianity than coming to church and shouting. We have the victory. And it needs to show itself in our marriages, and our relationships, on the job. Amen. I'm sick and tired and you've all heard it. How many have heard this before? I'll pray for me because I'm the only Christian on my job. You got the wrong imagination about what a being Christian is because my Bible tells me you're the hope of glory. Yeah. Amen. They ought, to, they, they, they ought to be praying, God, don't send a Christian here because if they send a Christian here, they're going to turn everything upside down. Amen. They're told they're just, they're, look, there's the ones, the little disciples, the ones that turn the world upside down. If you're the only Christian in your job, you ought to be turning around. People ought to be getting saved. People ought to be getting delivered. Yeah. Amen. I worked in a place, it was, 100, it was, a, it was a, a, a shop of 100 men. Amen. And, and that place was so corrupt and so bad and so terrible, man, that, you know, uh, we bankrupt the company. Amen. Drugs and alcohol and everything was so perverse that we bankrupt the company. Before it went bankrupt, one man turned it around. One man that was on fire for God. One man that would not fit the a mold that the rest of the church was giving him. He acted and walked and talked differently, but he had the power of an almighty God operating in him. And it got my attention. Amen. And I started talking with him and he captivated me. And after I got captivated, it got somebody else's attention. And after that person got attention, it got somebody else's attention. In a Mormon-owned company, we were having worship service and Bible studies at, at lunchtime inside the company. Found out that the majority of the men that were working there were backsliders, grew up in the church. 
Many of them got delivered again. Many of them experienced the power of an almighty God. One man that was there was uh, 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 working there. This is way back in the day. And, and, and he got arrested for uh, uh, robbing a bank. And they, gave, and, and they were going to send him to a prison. But they gave him work furlough instead. And he went to work furlough and he turned in a dirty test. And if he turned in a dirty test, anything negative, he was going to prison. The power of God was there operating in, within us. And I prayed. I said, I said, you believe in the power of God talking to him all, the whole time? And he says, yes, I do. I go, we're going to pray that that test comes out negative and that you remain there. Amen. Not only did his test turn out negative, but everybody in that program's test was dirty, turned out, positive, turned out negative. And, and he's seen the power of God and he got his deliverance. If you are walking in the norm of what you think Christianity is, you are not walking in the power of God. I hear all the time, you know, and you can relate with this. You know what, man, I like Pastor Mike, but he's raw. Amen. That's just raw. That's just, you know, he's just in your face. Let me tell you something. You've been, you, 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 you have been captivated by the imagination of religion. They take the preachers today and they put them into a mold and they make them talk the same way, act the same way, and be sensitive about your feelings. I don't care about your feelings. I care about your soul. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and listen to this. So you, you, you get a minister, you get a pastor, you get a preacher that doesn't fit that mold. And, oh, he's just raw. He hurts my feelings. And I, you know, I want to hear something nice and something sensitive and something soothing. I want to hear about the historical Jesus. I don't want to know about the Jesus that delivers. I want to know about the historical Jesus so I can have a reason to have my pity parties. Jesus told the people on the bank, he said, what did you come out here to see? Did you come out here to see a preacher in fine linen clothing and to speak eloquently? He goes, no, but you came here and you saw a man with raw power. You saw a man with raw courage. You saw, you saw a prophet. But I tell you something, he said, you saw more than a prophet. We still, he, he was getting a hold of their imagination. So, you know what? Don't come here looking for the Pharisees. Don't come here looking for the Sadducees. Because what you're going to experience is the power of an almighty God. If you ain't never experienced the power of God before, you will experience it here. Amen. Amen. Your response to faith is based on your imagination. Anybody ever told you to do something in faith and what the first thing came out of your mouth is, I can't. Because your imagination kept it, captivated you and put these barriers there in front of you. You know what imagination does? It removes barriers. Why do you think you tell your children you could be anything you want to be? I don't care you're black, brown, white, yellow, orange, pink, or polka dot. You tell that child there's nothing limiting you because you want to expand their imagination. But the problem is you send them to a school that puts the limitations on them. You release them to a world that puts the limitations on them and you don't consistently work with them to keep their imagination open so they can become anything they want to become. And then at a certain age, they begin to adapt. And somebody's captivated their imagination. They put these self-limitations on themselves. My Bible tells me with God, all things are possible. Everything. Your imagination in the hand of God is a powerful tool. Let me say it again. Your imagination in the hand of God is a powerful tool. You can't imagine something stupid, which was what many people do. Well, I'm going to pray that I rob a bank and in Jesus' name, I'm going to get away with it. And I'm going to use that money to build the kingdom. And you can imagine that all you want to. But that's not covered under grace. Why? Because you're stealing. Right? You're doing things outside. So that's not covered under grace. So if you're going to imagine something, you've got to make sure that it's covered under grace. God will do everything he said when it's covered under grace. But many of our prayers are outside of grace. So we're getting upset, we're getting frustrated, we're getting discouraged. Why isn't this operating for me? Because you're operating or trying to operate uh, uh, grace principles outside of grace, and that don't work. Your imagination in the hands of God is a powerful, powerful tool. I've heard it said that, you know, you, you, you can't keep a man of faith down. Yes, you can. Amen. How many have faith here? It's not a setup question. Amen. I <laughs> set it up right now. It's not a set up question. There. <laughs> but you're spinning your wheels for the last five years. Why is that? It's not your faith. You got faith you could do it. But you don't have the imag imagination to go for it. You see, your faith gives you the ability to believe in it, but your imagination gives you the ability to go for it. Well, I believe God wants me to have a business, and I, I, I got a business plan. I got this and I got that, and it's been sitting on the shelf collecting dust. I know I'm talking to some people in here. 
because you have creative ability. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is the author of witty inventions. Do you know how much glory God gets out of a nobody becoming a somebody in the financial world? In the financial world, all of a sudden you had nothing. Now you got 5, 10, 15, 20 employees. How you do this? Amen. Well, where's your business degree? Where's your business knowledge? Well, how'd you get here? Well, I got faith. That's how we say it. Well, we got faith. No, I had imagination too, man. I took my faith off the shelf and I played with my imagination. I could see in my eyes, in the, in the mind of my eye. I could see the building. I could see it operating. I could see the people working there. I did something about it. How many of us have, have, have a business plan or an idea? See, the Bible says God gave you the ability to get wealth. Prosperity messages have robbed you of your imagination. We're sitting, well, God, I'm playing, I'm praying, I'm claiming, and I'm seeding, I'm doing. God didn't say anything about you seeding for prosperity. He says, work. Amen. I know that's a dirty job. <laughs> Nobody wants to work. But you know what? A lot of you in here that, don't, that, that, that want your prosperity, you don't want to work for it, man. You're eating food yeah. that you're robbing. Right. If you don't work, you don't eat. You can see, I love to eat. <laughs> so that means I got to work. Amen. Our imagination in the hands of God is a powerful, powerful tool. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Or, or chapter 3, rather. And we're going to read this out of the NIV version. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or, or um, all we ask or imagine. What can you imagine? How much can you imagine? You see, our problem is we have been conditioned to imagine things negatively. We've been conditioned to imagine bad things. But what can you imagine positively? Can you imagine your children saved and filled with the Holy Ghost? In spite of what they're doing and how they're acting? Can you imagine yourself walking in financial freedom? Can you imagine yourself being, being blessed so that you could be a financial blessing? Can you imagine yourself having victory and joy in spite of all that's happened to you? I'm sorry bad things happen to you, but when are you going to get over it? When are you going to stop crying in your beer? It never goes away. Amen. The Bible says when the unclean spirit goes out of the man, he, looking for dry, uh, he, looks, he walks through a dry place looking for a home. When he don't find one, he comes back and he knocks here. And I shared with this last week, talk, or a couple weeks ago, talking with Brother Bob. He's telling me about his upbringing and how his family has trained him and did all this. And I'm sitting on the fence and we're talking. And all of a sudden, that little spirit do, starts talking in my ear and saying, you poor thing. You didn't have that privilege. You didn't have that opportunity. They didn't train you. Amen. And you know what? Years and years ago, I would have fell for it. I go, you know what, man? Man, I'm comparing myself with him. Man, he's blessed. I didn't have that blessing. I wasn't loved. Nobody nurtured me. Nobody cared for me. It ain't got nothing to do with who I am now. Amen. Because my Bible tells me I'm the son of a living God. Amen. I am not accepted because of what I'm doing. I'm accepted because I believe what he said about me. I'm no longer performance oriented, I'm grace oriented. I accept what God says about me. Until you can look in the mirror and see who you are as God says you are and you walk like it, act like it, talk like it, think like it, live like it and die like it, you are going to continuously be performance operated. Amen. I am, you know, I've heard this. You ever heard the saying, once an addict, always an addict? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. This is the express image that's not true. Amen. Amen. And why is that? And I don't need a meeting and I don't need people and I don't need to cry in my beer and I don't need to be tormented about the things of my past. All I need to do is put on the cloak of righteousness and walk in the victory that he designed for me. It takes imagination to do that. To so say, well, I, gee, I can never see myself free. You never will be. You never will be. In the hands of the enemy, your imagination can be destructive. See, it's only your imagination as ownership. But you're giving it to somebody. You're giving it to God to build it up or you're giving it to Satan to destroy it. 
You look in the street and you see people pushing carts and you see, pe see people living under bridges and you see people uh, 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 struggling and so forth and so on. It's because of their imagination. Yes. It's not bad luck. It's not bad breaks. All right, because your imagination can get you out of it. Yeah. Remember that movie about that gentleman that had, uh, uh, I think it was a, some, a heart machine and he ended up going to... Um, uh, Glide uh, Memorial, or Glide Tidings in San Francisco. What was the name of that movie? The Pursuit of Happiness. That was a true story. There was another woman who was completely homeless that put herself through Harvard. For, amen. These were people that said, you know what? I'm not bound by this. And they imagined themselves being a success. And they didn't quit because they weren't quitters. Your imagination created you to be a quitter, quitter. And your imagination created you to be a quitter because everybody around you told you you're a quitter. Come on. Right. Come on. And not only did it tell me a quitter, so did my choices in life. I've been married 10 times. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> only two. <laughs> right? But, see, I got five kids, seven kids, eight kids, nine kids, and they all have different daddies. Come on. Come on. Come on. I got 10 kids all over the world, not me. And I don't, know, I don't know where they are. So that makes us feel like quitters and losers. God can take that thing and turn your story around if you allow him to. Your imagination keeps you alienated from the promises of God. It's not a lack of prayer. It's not a, it's not a, a lack of fashion. It's a lack of confidence in God. You see, we feel we have to perform to get God to do something. God already done it. He's done everything that he's going to do. One of the most profound statements in the, in, in, in the Bible is that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. It's finished. He said that on the cross of Calvary. It's finished. Now he gave us his word. He gave us his name, the power and the authority of his name. He gave us the blood. He gave us all these things, tools that we can work with, and we're stuck crying about how the devil's beating me up. A defeated foe. Yeah. If the devil is your enemy, all right, uh, and he is, but if you're fighting him, he's already captured your imagination. Do you know how a bully operates? They don't have to lift a finger. All they got to do is sell what we used to call wolf tickets. You know what I'm going to do when I see you? Amen. Man, when these doors open, you better lock up. And in your imagination, you're starting to see pictures of destruction. And you start acting on that because the bully intimidated you. Many of us are living under the intimidation of the enemy. And the Bible says he's defeated. Are you ever afraid of somebody? How many, you know, I, I, I'm old school, man. We, you know, when you fought with somebody, you did not just fight them. And see, today, you're done, you're finished. You know, when I, I grew up, man, you know, what you could do from your shoulders determined your reputation. So sometimes, you, you know, you got in a fight with somebody from another neighborhood, another city, you did not fight them one time. You fought them every single time you saw them, right? And then you got tired of fighting them, right? Now, you beat somebody up every time you see them. How afraid of them are you going to be? Not very. Yeah, you know, I've had friends of mine tell, tell people, look, man, we've been fighting. I'm done. When are you going to get done fighting the devil? Before you realize you got the victory. Yeah. Yeah. We're casting out devils. We're casting down devils. We're doing everything else except glorifying God. The enemy captures your imagination, and he holds you in bondage to that. You, as I said this in, during this series, you will never rise above your imagination. you got to believe you are, and you got to work for it. Go to Romans chapter 6. And this is the uh, e easy reading version. I, I, I liked it. Man. Yeah. And came across it and go, oh, this is very good. Let's read. Romans 6, 16. Surely you know that you become the slaves of whatever you give yourselves to. What is an imagination? Is an imagination of whatever? Yeah. You become enslaved. Do you ever watch a movie and it strikes fear in you? Nothing in your house. You're a grown adult. You know there's no such thing as a boogeyman. But you're not going to go in the kitchen. Because your imagination got a hold of you. 
And I was talking to Lola and Weezy this morning. We were talking, I don't know how we got on the subject. We were talking about closet monsters. <laughs> and we realized all three of us had that in common. <laughs> I'm a grown adult. <laughs> and I'll be in bed and Gloria's getting ready for bed. I said, Gloria, close the closet door. <laughs> Ain't nothing in there, Michael. I said, close the door. <laughs> My imagination. And I'll tell you what, I cannot go to sleep comfortably with that closet door open. <laughs> Amen. And I overcome that. See, the enemy don't ever quit. No. Then I get up in the middle of the night, go to go bathroom, put my feet on the floor. <laughs> now there's the under the bed monster. <laughs> so, oh my God, I ain't never gonna get over this. No, because you're never gonna get over. It. You're never gonna you'll conquer it, but never get over it because the enemy knows it worked. He knows it worked and he doesn't have any new inventions, so he keeps coming back, waiting for time for your vulnerable and weak to captivate you again. Whatever, you, surely you know that you become the slaves of whatever you give yourselves to. Anything or anyone you follow will be your master. You can follow sin or you can obey God. There's no middle road. There is no middle road. There is no independence in this life. Amen. You can't say I'm my own man because you're either made by God or you're made by the devil. Right. Or you can obey God following sin, spiritual death, but obeying God makes you right with him. I can do nothing other than to surrender to get the victory that I need. Captivate your imagination. Job had said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. His imagination caused him to make sacrifices in case his children did something wrong. He operated in the imagination of his mind. The problem is there's too many believers today that operate in the imagination of their mind and not operate in the imagination of their re renewed mind. God does not accept us based on our performance. But how many of us here have been taught to believe that? I know I did. I was taught to believe that. I had to work for the kingdom. Jehovah Witnesses believe that with all their might. Mormons believe that with all their might. They have to give two years service in the missionary field. This is the missionary field to them. Amen. Why do you think Jehovah Witnesses come at your door? Because they're trying to be part of the 144,000 that make it into the, into, king, into the kingdom. They're not doing it for anything else than to try to gain entrance. Why do you testify? Why do you share? Why do you give somebody else the, uh, 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 your testimony? Why do you try to win people to the kingdom? Somebody told me one time when I was just young in the Lord, they said, you know what, you don't care about me. All you want to do is, is get me saved so you have another soul on your belt and you can hang it on your belt. You know what, he spoke a truth to me. I did not know a thing about him. All I knew was I had to be performing. I used to take a stack of flyers this big, I kid you not, in Standard Fruitvale and, and, and uh, uh, Bancroft. And when the red light turned, uh, when the light turned red, I'd jump between the cars and start passing off flyers. Get as far as I can until they turn green, then run back to the light and do it again all day long. And if I wasn't performing, I wasn't feeling I was doing my job as a Christian. You see, not walking in that kind of imagination, I am enjoying my Christianity. I'm enjoying my church service. I'm enjoying fellowship because I'm in competition with nobody. How many follow what I'm talking about? Now, in some people's imagination, they look at him, well, he's not saved. Look what he's wearing when he's preaching. Where's his tie? Where's his suit? Where's his jewelry? Where's his King James verbiage? He's not saved. Well, that's your imagination. Those things don't get me saved. My faith in God gets me saved. Your faith in God gets you saved. Amen. And that's as far as our imagination gets us. We can believe God to be saved. But now that I'm saved, the church has stood in line and started issuing marching orders. You got to do this. You got to do that. I do those things not to get. I do those things because I've been touched. There's a difference. There is a difference. Now I'm doing the same works, but because of a different perspective. I'm not doing it to try to win favor. I'm doing it because he touched me. You need to have an imagination. You are what God says you are. Not what you think you are. Not what somebody says you are. And this is a hard part because you look in the mirror and who do you see? Who do you see? No, you never, you've never saw you. 
You have never saw you. You saw your image. Amen. In order to see you, you need to get outside of this to see you. You saw your image. And all God wants you to do is get past your image and see the image that he created. You look in your mirror, that mirror's not you. The person looking in the mirror at you is an image. I saw me. And I look so good. <laughs> hey Amen. I'm telling you, I look so good. I was in a facility sniffing some dry cleaning fluid. And oh, I felt something moving in me. It came out of me. And turned around and looked at me, and it was me. And I looked at me, and I go, wow, what a trip. But I couldn't stop. Couldn't pull the bag away from my face. Talk about God's grace. Yeah, come on, come on. And he looked at me and started weeping and said, what are you doing? And I don't remember these words, but I, he started elevating off the ground. And he told me these words. When I hit the ceiling or when I disappear, you're going to die. Stop. Please stop. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And all of a sudden, he started getting higher and higher. And this fear got a hold of me. And I pulled the bag away from my face with all my might. I go, no. And I took the bag and I ran to the toilet and I flushed it. And this beautiful man. <laughs> Wait till you see yours. All that you've been aspiring to get, you're going to realize it's locked up in you. Amen. So he came down. And when he hit the ground, it's this big old smile on his face, and I felt him, and I watched him walk right back into my body. Amen. You ever get so high and something happened, you ain't high no more? <laughs> Amen. So don't sit here and say, oh, he was on a trip, because that was gone. <laughs> that was gone. Man. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to be real here, man. So he come in, and I felt him walk in my body, and I felt him turn around in my body and look back out my eyes. There was an experience there that got a hold of my life that changed me for a few days because it wasn't, it, it, was, it, was, it was a heavenly design touch, but I didn't respond to it in faith. Amen. I walked out of my cell completely different than I was when I walked in, and everybody saw it. And what was incredible, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and the experience I had at the moment, it took me back to that moment. And I said, that's what happened to me. God touched me. So when you look in the mirror, you see the image of the things that you've done. Or am I the only one? You look in the mirror, so, and you're combing your hair, you're brushing your teeth, and all of a sudden, a reflection comes across your imagination, and you start thinking about all the dirty, nasty, despicable, disgusting little things that you've done or happened to you. And what's the first thing we do? We stop looking at the image. Right. Brush our teeth, wash our face, hurry up and get out of there. You got to be able to see your image in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your imagination has to capture that. Somebody can walk up today and say, you know what, I remember you did that. Blah, 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 blah. I said, that's your remembrance, right. not mine. That's right. You ain't holding me captive to that. As a matter of fact, that, get out of my face. I ain't dealing with you. Right. See, we want to be oh so nice. Why do you want to be nice to the devil? Right. Somebody coming up to you and tell you what you used to do, they ain't your friend. Right. They're trying to pull you back into bondage. Right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Let me, let me share something with you. We think we need to do things to get righteous. I need to fast and I can get righteous. I need to pray and I can get righteous. I need to do works and I can get righteous. I'm never righteous because I don't tithe. No, you got a problem. <laughs> but you are righteous. Let me share something with you. This is an incredible fact. You can never be more saved than you are right now. There's no gauge to salvation. We did that. I don't drink, so I'm more saved. Who said? I don't swear, so I'm more, I'm more saved than you. That's pride. That's ego. That means you've got issues. That means you've got problems. you got all those things. That don't mean you ain't saved. That's between you and God. You will never be more righteous than you are right now. 
You can make yourself believe you're going to be more righteous and, 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 and because of your works you feel good, but what happens when the devil comes knocking at your door? He pulls the works out from underneath you and there you go again, starting all over again. That's why the Bible says, though a righteous man, Proverbs chapter 27, though a righteous man fall, he rises up again seven times. It's your righteousness that gives you back up. It's the unrighteousness that knocks you down. The Bible says if we confess our sins before God, he's faithful and just and to forgive us of our unrighteousness. You had to be righteous to be unrighteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not based on what you do, based on what he done. I'm hoping this will liberate some of y'all from your, from, from your performance works. I'm not saying stop doing them. I'm going to start doing them for the right perspective. Start doing it for the right reason. Because you're imagining, I'm going to get God's favor by doing this. I'm going to, I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to hold my breath un, until I turn blue. And then God will see and God will save my mother, my brother, my father. No, he already said, he says, if you're saved, <coughs> your whole household will be, <coughs> be saved. The enemy got you into performance-oriented work because if everything happens in God's time, and if you do it for three, four, five, six months, one, two, three, four, five years, it ain't happening, you get disappointed and say, oh, well, I guess this don't work. No, it don't work because you're doing it the devil's way instead of God's way. The Bible says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be what? It's not based on what... <laughs> Somebody's happy about going back to class. <laughs> My God, why can't we be like that coming back to church? <laughs> Man, Sunday, I had to go to church. <laughs> I was just seeing her face and her smile as she's running to go to church. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.21. Hey, I love those kids. Man. For our sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin. Who knew no sin. So that in and through him we might become endued with, viewed as, in, and examples of the righteousness of God, what we ought to be. Approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. All that other kind of preaching takes away his goodness. The Bible says the goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. But we want to be that. Don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong because there's some of you that are so perverted. You're going to take this and say, well, you know what? That's why I've been this way for 20 years. No, you've been that way for 20 years because you're resistant to God. Because if you accept this kind of a teaching, it causes, it creates a change within you. You see, I could not make a change in my life by going to church. He got inside of me and created the change. I didn't have a desire to do this, that thing, or the other thing because he created a change by opening my understanding to me that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, some people say, well, you know, who is that arrogant guy to say that he's the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? I hear him blasting his music. Amen. I downloaded a song last night. You remember, Atomic Dog. <laughs> I go, hey, I remember this. Nothing but the dog. Why must I chase the cat? Why must I be like that? Nothing but the dog in me. How can he be righteous? Because of that? How many follow what I'm talking about? You see, but I got saved under this umbrella. You're saved. You accept the Christ, your person. Listen to me. I got saved on a Sunday. They were drilling me Monday. You can't be acting like that. You can't be talking like that. You can't be going to those low rider car shows. You can't be listening to worldly music. And I had stacks and stacks of music. We didn't have cell phones. Amen. Not even cassettes. I'm that old. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That week, I took all my music to work and sold it. Stop listening to secular music from that point on. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a time you need to get filled with the words. You need to get filled with the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will lead you. Not man. How many follow what I'm talking about? So I started doing all these things. Started giving up all this stuff. We didn't go to games anymore. We didn't go camping anymore. We didn't play basketball anymore. Just gave everything. Went to church! Look forward to church, Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, once a month, all day and night. 
going to church, on, you know, uh, outside of church to other studies and so forth and so on. My life was consumed with my Christianity or religiosity. They captivated my mind to where I started feeling and thinking I was better than everybody else. Come on, don't look at me like that, man. I start losing my relatability. How can they do that? Come on, I heard some of y'all say that. Some of you alcoholics. Some of you liars, thieves, drug addicts. Say, how can I look at you? Go, Ain't that long ago you was out there? Now you change your imagination so much that you lose your relatability. You don't have the righteousness of God so you can lose your relatability. I'll never forget what God brought me out of. But I don't have to identify with them to show them the goodness of God. Why do you think he put righteousness within you? So they could see the righteousness and want what you got. They don't want what you got that could act in like a fruit loop. Amen. Amen. You're talking to somebody who don't know nothing about God, don't know nothing about heaven, don't know nothing about the Holy Spirit, and you're walking around, you're going to tell them, Amen, God, I'm, God, good, how you doing today? Oh, I'm blessed. God's been so good to me. I'm blessed and highly favored. I've been seeding and believing God to bless me in the kingdom so I can be a blessing to others. How art thou? <laughs> that's, how, that's how our imagination makes us come across to people. They want something that's relatable. They want something that's real. They want something that's alive. You see, Jesus, did, did, you know, when he brought, he brought the kingdom into to, to the earth, he did not make it unrelatable. He came, he spoke to men where they were at, captivating their imagination. People that knew nothing about baking, he told them, he, people, do nothing, uh, uh, people that knew about baking, he told them, I'm the bread of life. People knew about agriculture, he said, I'm the Rose of Sharon. People knew about water. He says, I, I, I'm the living water. He talked to people where they were at. See, our imagination gets us to talk down to people instead of talking with them. Because the enemy has captivated our imagination so we can make ourselves feel good about ourselves. That I've accomplished so much and I'm so far in the kingdom right now. You'll get there one day. Your imagination has been slender. Now, again, I want to say this again and qualify this. I'm not saying this to uh, approve or to agree with your stand and holding on to your unrighteousness because there's no excuse for that. That's a good time to say amen. amen. What you're saying is I'm rebellious and stubborn. People that have got a hold of the kingdom of God, there is a consistent change in them. They don't have to fight. They don't rebel. They're not stubborn. They're not resistant. There's a change. If you're fighting and you're rebelling and you're resistant, you're being held and conformed to the imagination that the devil has given to you. Well, I just can't see that. That's because your imagination hasn't been opened up. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our imaginations caught us up in the doings and not the becoming. And we lose our freedom in Christ because of that. The greatest experience that I had in God was when he touched me. There was like 10,000 pounds lifted up off my shoulders. I looked around. I go, For the first time in my life, I felt love. For the first time in my life, I felt freedom. I felt a joy. I smiled for the first time in my life. If you think I don't smile now, man, you shoot. I, I'm like a howdy doody clown compared to the way I smiled before. I smiled for nothing. I won a lottery and there was no smile on my face, man. You show no emotions. Hallelujah. See? That's my smile. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 5 through 9. Let's read. Hallelujah. Glory to God. For he foreordained us, destined us, planned. Listen, before you were born. Hallelujah. In the beginning of the time. Fred Price was on God's mind. Before he did anything righteous. Before he did any event. Before he'd done any prayer. Before he did any works in the church. God already had and printed in his mind the image of what Fred would look like. 
not just him, but everybody in it. I don't know about you, that ought to make you shout. I think about it, you know what, I've been robbed because my family had a demonic, devilish imagination. And instead of formulating me to become a man of God or, to, or, or give me the instructions of God, they taught me how to be a thug, if not by verbiage, by example. So they captured my imagination because in my neighborhood, it was the drug dealers, it was the thugs that were the, that were the people to look up to. So it captured my imagination. I didn't want somebody like, like, like Mr. Rick, great guy. But where I come from, he was not a great guy because he worked for a living, sucker. <laughs> Amen. Forget that he worked for a living and he still has what he worked for when he started. I worked six months and lose it all in a booking. <laughs> he lost everything. <laughs> for he ordained us, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted, revealed at his, as his children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the purpose of his will because it pleased him. Your works didn't please him. Do you know what pleased him? What he did for you. Now, we have some men here that got good hearts and they know how to do things, man, and they'll do things for their children, they'll do things for their wife, not because they want to do things, not because they're trying to please them, it pleases them to do it. Amen. How many follow what I'm talking about? It pleases me to make you this dinner. It pleases me to bless you this way. It pleases, and you see, that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. I'm out here testifying because it pleases me. I'm not here testifying to get favor. I'm testifying because it pleases me. It pleases me because it pleased him to make me. Amen. This takes the pressure off of being a Christian. You mean I ain't got to go through all these steps? No, not unless you want to. And you'll be most miserable always trying to attain what you already have. You see, as believers, we need to learn how to dig in, draw out, and release. Amen. If you don't dig in, you don't draw out, you don't release, you don't get. But it can't be that simple. <laughs> Paul told the Galatians, he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have made it complicated because we're a, we worship science. We worship doctrines. We worship men. Amen. We worship education. And the more doctorate, the more knowledge, the more education somebody has, we feel that they know more than us. So we sit and we submit to somebody that is void of the power of God, but they got a lot of, doc they got a lot of DDs, DRs, and PhDs, and BS behind their name. I said, man, I could never be like them. You should not want to be like them. Amen. God, God, God said in his word, he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen. 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 When I read that for the first time in my mind, I was glad to be a fool. <laughs> Amen. Here, God, you went all the way down to Oakland, picked me up out of the gutter and said, I want this fool. Yeah. Y'all don't want to be a fool for Jesus. Yeah. Amen. As a matter of fact, Paul said, he said, Paul said it like this. He says, I'm a fool for Jesus. Yeah. Who's fool are you? In accordance with the purpose of his will because it pleased him. It wasn't your works. It wasn't your giving. It wasn't your doing. It pleased him when he thought about you. He said, you know what, man? I'm going to make a path of righteousness for Charlie. I'm going to make a path of righteousness for Richard. Whether they take it or not, that's up to them. But I'm going to make a path of righteousness. I'm going to foreordain them to be saved if they want to be saved. It doesn't mean he took over their will. It means he made a path for them if they want it. And it pleased him that he did that. And then he got double pleased when they called on him. Void of any financial giving, void of any religious works, void of any sacrifice, it pleased him. I don't know if we ever get the totality of this. God said, I want you because I want you. But why? Because I want you. But they said, well, it don't matter what they said. Amen. It doesn't matter what their imagination of you is. It doesn't matter what your imagination of you is. God said. 
It pleased him, and it was his kind intent so that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, favor, and mercy, which he so freely, freely, we have a problem with that word. People used to do things for me, what do you want? Open up a door. What do you, what do you open the door for, man? I want to open the door myself. Close it. Are you trying to get behind me? <laughs> Amen. Make me a nice dinner. What are you up to? Where you been? What'd you do? Come on, I'm not the only one here. Amen. I'm highly suspicious because people don't do nice things. Just to do nice things. They got motives. No, I was talking about me. Hello? God ain't like that. He said, freely. Listen, he said, freely you have been give, received. Freely you have received. You know why we're not freely sharing this gospel of grace, joy, and victory? Because we're not accepting it freely. We're accepting it out of duty and works. I got to go to church. No, you don't got to. You should want to. I ain't never going to get that image out of my head, that little girl running here, <laughs> running back to church and excited about it. We have a problem. And because the preachers have a problem preaching to an empty church, they mandate the fact that you need to come to church. Start preaching church attendance. I don't preach church attendance. You don't want to come to church, that's your problem. How many found that out the hard way? Not coming, I didn't call you. Not come, I didn't visit you. Not come, I didn't send you a, 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 a card. We miss you. What's missing in church? C-H, then the U down below, R-C-A. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are. <laughs> didn't do all that. Why is that? Because you're a free man. You come because you want to. You Because you've been touched. You come because you know you need, you need this. See, the problem with putting all those mandates on people, it takes them away from the grace of God. And they're trying to win God's favor by their merits and by their works. And I know this is not a popular message. But it's a message that can change and transform yourself. Amen. Amen. We appease ourselves with our works and try to prove to others that we are a good person. Especially our family. See, I've changed. How come you can't recognize the change in my life? Look at all that I've done. If they don't see that, then we, buy, then we buy big bumper stickers for our cars. <laughs> then we wear T-shirts. And we show everybody that we're Christians, except God. Because we can't accept what he said because of the stuff that goes in our mind. There's a battle in your field in your mind all the time. But are you casting it down? Are you walking in his grace? Or are you following through with those thoughts? If you're continuously following through with your thoughts, I'm not even talking to you because you've been there now for 20 years and you ain't going to change. <laughs> Amen. Because you can't walk, you only walk in the imagination of your mind. It hasn't been renewed by God and you won't let it get renewed by God because so you're, entr- you're so entrenched in who you think you are supposed to be and what people said you are. What people said you are is irrelevant to what God says you are. Amen. Amen. I am not what I did not turn out the way that my family said I would. Amen. I was going to have a cell in Alcatraz, according to them. Amen. The problem with many of us, we have still, you may be grown, you may have children of your own, you may be even a grandparent, but you're still subjecting yourself to the imaginations of other people. You need to stop subjecting yourself to the imagination. The problem with subjecting yourself to the imagination of other people, you, you, you surrender to them. Amen. You know, um, I'll be 70 this year. And my, if my mother was alive, I would become a stupid little kid when she started talking to me because she had that way of making me feel that way. How many follow what I'm talking about? You'd be 40, 50 years old. And how many know when you get around your mom, it's a different story? <laughs> All of a sudden, you lose your authority as a man and you're her kid. Am I the only one? You know, she's saying something ain't right, but you know what, man? I'm her kid. I ain't going to say nothing. 
So you become that kid with all these fears and then these insecurities because of the imagination of her mind that you subjected yourself to. I'm not saying stand up to her unrighteousness or uh, unholiness, but I'm talking about why do you got to live under the subjection of her imagination of who she thinks you are? Or him or whatever, or whatever it may be. It could be your spouse. It could be your children. Amen. Turn your Bibles over to uh, 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 Joshua chapter 2. Hallelujah. Your imagination... I'm sorry, Judges 11. Hallelujah. Self-image can be formed by accepting the imaginations of other people. You're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly, you'll never amount to anything. Amen. Oh, here, come, here comes Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe been married four times, working on his fifth. This one's going to fail too. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm really not concerned what people think about me. And it's not a defiance, not out of anger. You know, before I had that, I didn't care. I don't care what you think. Yeah, I did. And you could tell yourself you don't care either. So, you know, it, it, and if you tell yourself you don't care and you're drowning your sorrows with mind-altering substances, you do care. You see, people could come against me and have all these opinions against me and it don't make me do anything that alters my reality because I don't care. I value my wife's opinion of me, but my uh, 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 um, lifestyle is not dependent upon her opinion of me. Because I have to do what God's called me to do. That's not necessarily connected to her opinion of me all the time. Well, I don't think you should do that. And, uh, you know, and if we walk in the average church where they say the husband and wife need to be in 100% in agreement all the time and you need to come to the table and you need to work together and figure it out. Well, my Bible tells me I have to stand before God by myself. So if God tells me to do something in, 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 you know, independent of her, I'm responsible to understand what God says and turn a deaf ear to what she says, even if I don't like what she says or, or it creates a problem in my home. Okay, let's get this through. Look over her to see how she responded to that. So that we can get past this. Yeah. Every time I talk about it, everybody goes like. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> See how the enemy's captured our imagination? Yeah. Amen. Men can't be men today. Yeah. Toxic masculinity. Yeah. If my masculinity is toxic, you weak. Bottom line. Amen. Because my masculinity helps me appreciate your feminism. Amen. I honor the fact that you're a woman. I honor the fact that you are God-fearing. But God gave me a role, and I'm a warrior. Amen. In every sense of the word. This stupid world we're living in. Amen. Going to allow society or somebody's opinion rob you of what God created you to be. I'm losing my train of thought here where I was going with this. I had a good point to bring out with there. That was a good point. That was a good point anyway. Amen. That was a good point anyway, man. Amen. Never mind. I don't agree with this, so I'm not going to support it. Don't support it. Don't support it. There was a time her and my mother-in-law both sitting there while I'm preaching. <laughs> Amen. Not for a day, not for a week. Not for a series. But for a long period of time. Legs crossed, arms crossed, head turned, and eyeballs crossed. And you know what I did? Ah, preach the word. <laughs> Amen. Here's your food. You know what I did? I ate it. Amen. You see, we get upset with one another without realizing that the other person is only subject to their imagination. I couldn't be upset with her because that's not her. How many follow what I'm talking about? So I had to stand the test of time. She could say, you know what, maybe there's something what he's saying because it ain't moving him. Maybe there's some truth to this. 
And she was just, she was just having an imagination out of her own woundedness. Hurts. <laughs> There's no such word as woundedness. <laughs> I got that from Charlie. <laughs> Amen. She was, her imagination just captivated out of her own hurt. So the one with a sound imagination will be the one that brings the healing. Come on, brother, turn around and tell your wife you've got a sound imagination. Amen. So you subject yourself to the imagination of other people, you will lose all the time. Because nobody will see your value in you but you. Until you show your value. And value is proven over time. It's not proven in a week. It's not proven in a month. You see, my value and what I'm saying got proven to her over time. In the heat, she saw the character. In the problems, she saw the character. In the good times, she saw the character. In the bad times, she saw the character. So that got to be proven over time. Some of y'all want to become an overnight wonder and get all, you know, you know, you know, woman, the Bible says to honor the man. That's nothing you demand, it's something you command. There's a difference between demanding and commanding. Amen. I walk into the house, my presence commands it. Amen. My presence commands it. I walk in, been gone all day, come home. Are you hungry? The fact that I was there, I got that honor. What? Nothing to eat here? That's demanding it. And then you get mad because your presence didn't command it. Let's read Judges 11. I'll get past that. That'll be for another series. Hallelujah. So you got to understand something. People's opinion does not devalue you unless you accept their opinion right. as fact. There's a whole lot of people in this area that don't like Pastor Mike, that don't like El Shaddai, because we allow them, whoever them is, in this church, because we allow you to come looking like you look like on a Sunday to church. You ain't supposed to be looking like that. You're supposed to have your Sunday go to meet and clothes on. You're supposed to have your suits on, your hats on. You're, you know, women supposed to come all done up. Not standing up here in jeans and halter tops singing, we're praise unto God Almighty. Oh, what happened to that church? Unrighteous, unholy people follow an unrighteous, unholy man. Hallelujah. Their opinion doesn't change us. Now, how do you know that to be a fact? I'll tell you something. that uh, When we had our bookstore, Signs, Wonders, and Miracles, sent letters out to every single church in the area telling them we were going to seed back into their ministry and anybody that came into that church and bought into that store and bought anything, we were going to tithe back 10% of that purchase to the church. Not this church, their church. People from other churches came in there to see what material we had, to argue and to debate about our position. Not one church took us up on that. Not one pastor reached out. See, we'll reach across the board because our imagination understands I am who I am because of who he is, not what I do. Amen. People in the Bay Area are caught up in their service rather than their surrender. Amen. I was talking to Sister Denise and she was sharing with me people that she's known that come from out of state. And they're going to preachers and they're going to turn the Bay Area upside down. They're going to bring revival. Let me share something with you. The Bay Area is a cesspool of religion that our religious leaders don't want to touch. They go to San Jose and they fly over the Bay Area and they go to Sacramento. They used to go to San Francisco, but they don't do that no more. We can't follow the imaginations of denominations or religions or other Christians. We have to understand that their imagination does not dictate your value. You are valuable no matter what they think of you. And if you can't see that, my friend, you will never get a hold of the power of God that he has tapped inside of you. He has it in you so you could dig it in. He has it in you so you could draw it out. He has it in you so you could release it. But when you hold yourself captive to somebody else's imagination, you feel inferior and you can't tap into it. Man, y'all ought to be shouting today. Let's read. 
Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. But, amen. John is a great husband, but, what happens when we hear the but? Our heart drops, right? Somebody's coming up to you, right? And they'll, they'll come walking up to you, they'll go, Ricardo, you're a great guy, but, what do you mean, but? <laughs> Just to stop right there, we'd be good. <laughs> Don't need to go no further, man. Right. Jephthah was a uh, uh, the Gideonite was a mighty warrior, but he was a son of a harlot. Come on, come on. Stigma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to they wanted to imprint that in the vision of his imagination. Yeah. Put that picture in his mind. Let me share what that does to you. That makes you feel like a nobody. Come on, come on. See, I, I was born in 1951. Went to school, 60s. And then when you went to school, they always asked you your mother's name, father's name. Amen. They didn't ask, uh, what is the term for it now? Uh, birthing parent name. <laughs> they asked for the mother and father name, right? And they said, uh, I don't know. So I didn't know my father's name until I was like a teenager. And they said, oh, you're a bastard, huh? I'm not using that as a profane way. That's what they deemed people as having no father. I had to have a father. I'm here. (laughs) So how can I be a bastard? You're a bastard because you don't know him. Children were even introduced as a bastard child. What do you think that does to the imagination of that kid? I can't tell you how different I felt. I mean, even, even my brothers and sisters, because they didn't, they had dads. They weren't the bastard I was. And at times the father in my house made, rel- made reference to me being the bastard. So when somebody's imagination is so perverse against you, you start to take ownership of it. Too many of y'all in here have taken ownership of somebody else's imagination that has nothing to do with you, with who you are. Because who you are is 2 Corinthians 5.21, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what's across your imagination. You've got to change that picture. Or else you'll never change your life. Right. You see, I used to wonder when I was a kid, man, if, if, I, you know, if I could just go through a machine and get cleansed and start all over again, he affords you that. Yes. He'll cleanse your imagination yes. so that you can start all over again. Yes. You know, and it, it was bad enough that that was, term was used by family members, yeah, right. by school, but it was used by all of society. By all of society. And it was a label that carried you into your adulthood. So there's a whole generation of me's out there. And in here. That are still living under the stigma of that label. Not feeling good about yourself. You see you know who lost out on the lack of relationship. It was not me. It was the guy that ran away. It was the birthing man. Lost out. (laughs) I'll use it in that term. (laughs) Amen. It's a mighty warrior. You're a great person, but. You're a wonderful person, but. Stop being tied down to the but. Get rid of the label that they ascribed to you because the Bible says that God ascribed to you another label. Amen. Amen. Righteousness. You know what that means? Right standing with God. See, that title, bastard, did not give me a right standing with the rest of the kids in school. Separated me. It did not give me a right standing in society because they said there was something wrong with me. I'm broken. I'm damaged. I, was, I had to be no good. But else, why else would he have not, why, why else would he have ran away? Growing up with this imagination, I'm damaged. I'm no good. Nobody wants me. But listen to this. In the beginning of time, God said, I don't care what's going on with him. 
I have redeemed him. I will make a way for him. I will accept him. The Bible says you are accepted in the beloved. I am so sorry about all the misfortunes and the things that happened against you, but it does not define you. Get it out of the imagination of your mind and press forward to what God has for you. But he was a son of a harlot. Gilead was Jephthah's father. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, listen to me, my little brothers, they never stopped taunting me that I did not belong there. So I beat them up my whole life. Amen. Had no respect for them, and they had none for me, but they feared me. Not because I was some tough guy. I just responded out of hatred and hurt because of the title that was ascribed to me. They got new clothes. I got to hand me downs. They had parties. I got a piece of cake. They got new toys. We went to Salvation Army, and I was lucky if I got something. Why? I ascribed that all to the title that was ascribed to me. So I had to be broken. Something wrong with me. And here this man says, you know what? I'm not here. You cast him out. I want nothing to do with him. But he did not allow that to affect him. Fine, you, you want nothing to me? That's your problem. Right. <laughs> Amen. That is your problem. It doesn't dictate who I am or what I think about me. Yeah. Now they were into warfare. They were into battle. And, and then they come to him. Does it, uh, Jephthah, you know, there's other cities that are beating us up over here. Can you come help us? And many of us in here that are so broken that want acceptance would have just said, okay, anyone, go, go help them. And then when you help them, they, they're done with you and they throw you back out again. Hello? You know what he said? This is the hard part of me that people don't like. He said, Wait a minute. You called my mama a harlot and said, I'm the son of a whore. And you want my help? Wait a minute. Let me put a line in the sand here. I'm going to help you. Amen. But let me tell you what's going to cost you. You're going to have to forget this idea that I'm the son of a whore. You're going to have to forget that my mama's a whore. He said, I'll go back, me and my men, we're going to go back and we're going to win this battle for you. But I will be your king. I'm going to rescue you. You know what they said? Okay. He stood against what they thought of him. He goes, you know what? You may think that I'm a nothing, but within me lies power, authority, and ability to deliver you. So I'm not going there for you to use me. I'm not going there for you to abuse me. I'm going there to deliver you. And once I deliver you, our relationship is going to be healed. Stop allowing people to abuse you to get acceptance. Draw the line in the sand and walk in victory. Amen. Because you set yourself up for self-abuse and then you get mad at God for it. Did you learn something this morning? Come on, give God a praise.